stop treatment without also having very, very close monitoring. And this is something to think about really only after many years of treatment and something which you need to discuss carefully with your doctor before considering. So the best way to achieve a deep lasting molecular response is to keep taking the drug in the most effective dose on a regular basis. We've found from previous clinical trials in Australia that people who miss even a small percentage of their tablets, particularly in the first months of treatment, don't have quite as good a long-term molecular response to therapy. So it's important to keep taking the imatinib, nilotinib or disatinib as regularly as possible because missed doses can lead to resistance. So not everyone will respond to the conventionally available drugs, although the vast majority of people will. Around 80% of people have a very good response to imatinib and will remain on it long term. In a small proportion of cases, people have to change their tyrosine kinase inhibitor either because of intolerable side effects or because the treatment no longer works. In some people, after having an initial response, the BCR able level starts to creep back up and this is termed secondary or acquired resistance. Sometimes we find that this is because someone has stopped taking his, his or her tablets or we find it's because another tablet has been started which interacts with and interferes with the effect of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In other cases the emergence of resistance is due to mutations in the BCR able gene. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors bind to the able protein and have quite a tight fit to the shape of the molecule. Mutations in the gene result in a, in a change in the shape of the protein so that the drugs no longer efficiently bind. Fortunately, mutations are relatively uncommon, but they account for around 50% of cases of resistance to imatinib, for instance. One of the most important of the mutations and the first to be discovered is T315i. T315i results in resistance to all of the three currently available tyrosine kinase inhibitors, imatinib, nilotinib and disatinib. Fortunately, panatinib seems to still be effective in people who have the T315i mutation and so one of the major reasons for using panatinib these days is to control patients with resistance who've developed the T315i mutation. People who develop resistance who are otherwise young and fit may wish to consider whether an allogeneic stem cell transplant is an appropriate treatment. So as I said before, transplantation still has an important role in CML, but for carefully selected people who have not shown a good response to their initial tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. For the small proportion of people who progressed to the accelerated phase or blast crisis, allogeneic stem cell transplantation is still important since we do not have confidence that the drugs will control these phases of the disease in the long term. For people who develop blast crisis, the treatment is more like the traditional acute leukemia treatment involving a combination of intensive chemotherapy, often together with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor such as imatinib, nilotinib or disatinib. The response to treatment in blast crisis is not as good as in the chronic phase, so really it is absolutely essential whenever possible to get good control of the chronic phase so that blast crisis and accelerated phase never develop. For people who develop the T315i mutation, another treatment option is omacetaxine, which was formerly known as homoharringtonine. This is a plant-derived chemical which has quite a different mechanism of action from the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It doesn't bind specifically to the ABLE protein but has a more general toxic effect on protein production in the cells. The use of omacetaxine is, is restricted really to people with accelerated phase or blast crisis. So the currently available tyrosine kinase inhibitors can all be associated with an increased risk of birth defects. So it is important for men not to father a child while taking these drugs and for women not to become pregnant while taking these drugs. Many people with CML have been able to have a healthy child and this can usually be managed in a planned manner, first by getting the disease under good control and then by having a period of planned withdrawal of the drug during which the woman can become pregnant and carry a child through pregnancy. Interferon has been shown to be safe in pregnancy in people with chronic myeloid leukemia and can be used without harm to the baby because it does not cross the placenta and does not enter the baby's bloodstream. 
women who have come off their treatment for a year or so to have a baby usually have a very good response to treatment again when treatment is restarted but the aim should be to be off effective therapy for as short a time as possible and to get good control of the disease before stopping so that a, so that a clinical relapse of the leukemia cannot occur in the time that the treatment is withdrawn. For men, imatinib and other tyrosine kinase inhibitors may have some effect on fertility and could potentially reduce the sperm count. Therefore, for men who may wish to have children in the future, it may be advisable to store semen prior to commencing the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Many people with CML in Australia have participated in clinical trials and have benefited from their participation in trials. A clinical trial is a structured use of a new drug or even an old drug for a new purpose in which we test the safety and effectiveness of that drug either on its own or in combination. Clinical trials are divided into different phases. A phase one study is typically the first use of the drug in humans and usually focuses on the safety of the drug. In phase two studies, a drug which has a known safety profile is used in larger numbers of patients for a disease of particular interest. After passing through phase two, drugs may enter a phase three trial where the drug is compared against a pre-existing standard treatment. So for instance, when imatinib was first invented, the phase three trial, the IRIS trial, compared imatinib with interferon, which was at the time the best available medical therapy for CML. So we've continued to conduct clinical trials in CML over the last 10 or 15 years with the introduction of nilotinib, disatinib, and more recently panatinib and bosutinib. Australia has a very active role in clinical trials for CML and the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group, which is the major clinical trials organisation for blood cancers in Australia, has conducted more than 10 clinical trials in CML. You may have heard of the tidal studies, tidal 1 which was CML6 and tidal 2 which was CML9, which were looking at the best treatment of newly diagnosed patients with CML. And we've also conducted, for instance, the CML8 trial, which was a trial of stopping imatinib for people who'd achieved a deep molecular response. Study for newly diagnosed patients is CML11, and this is testing the combination of nilotinib and interferon, trying to harness the benefits of both of these drugs when given in combination with the aim of getting more patients to a deep molecular response so that they may one day have the possibility of being able to stop their drugs altogether and remain in treatment-free remission. CML has been an enormously important disease, not just in the area of haematology, but in, in the whole field of medicine, because it was the first disease for which we had a specific genetic abnormality, and it was the first disease for which we had a specific molecularly targeted treatment. And this means that many other cancers have learnt from the example of CML and used the information that we've learnt in CML to develop better treatments for a wide range of other cancers. Participation in a clinical trial, of course, always carries a small risk that, may, that there may be unexpected side effects to emerge from the study. And participating in a clinical trial often means a substantial time commitment because being monitored very closely also involves sometimes additional visits to hospital or additional visits to blood tests. I would encourage anyone who is offered a clinical trial to give serious consideration to participating because this is the way in which we improve the treatment for CML patients now and in the future. So if you've recently been diagnosed with CML, you may find this quite confronting and quite anxiety provoking, but most people find that they have a good response to treatment and that after a few months of their tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, as they see their PCR results showing better and better responses, most people realize that they will enjoy a very good quality of life and a near normal life expectancy. So if you've recently been diagnosed with CML and you have concerns, you can discuss these, of course, with your doctors, with your GP or with your blood specialist. And the Leukemia Foundation is available to provide advice and to help answer your questions. And it may be helpful for you to meet with other people who've had the experience of being diagnosed with CML or treated for the disease so that you can share your, your concerns and learn from their experiences.